الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم آئی ایم سبقت منصور فرام دا سینٹر فار ریسرچ اینڈ لیڈرشپ اینڈ مینجمنٹ ایشوز اینڈ ایز پارٹ آف آور لیڈرشپ ڈائریز سیریز وی آر ویری ویری فارچونیٹ ٹو بی سٹنگ ہیئر ٹو ڈے ود دا فارمر چیف آف دی پاکستان ایئر فورس اے چیف مارشل کلیم سادر صاحب اینڈ ویل بی ٹاکنگ ود ہیم اباؤٹ سم لیڈرشپ لیسنس فرام اینس انڈسٹریز کریئر سو تھینک یو ویری مچ فار بینگ ود Um, to start us off, sir, um, as a leader, um, what would you say has defined your leadership style? Um, what is it that characterizes it? What themes um, are um, prevalent? The style was that I, want, I always trusted people. I uh, delegated authority to them, you know, responsibility to them. I uh, established, when I took over, having seen uh, what I had gone through in the past, my own experience, uh, what I decided was that I wanted to dovetail the objectives of my immediate uh, subordinates into the grand plan of the Air Force, you know, mm-hmm. because if you drive from the top, you know, uh, you can't achieve much, you know, but if uh, there are people that are your direct subordinates, in this case, the principal staff officers, they also have maybe just two years less service than you have so they have a lot of experience too you know they have their own goals they have seen uh, a lot of uh, things related to the air force so they also have this urge and ambition to improve things you know and obviously so what i told them was that bring me a plan what is it that you want to achieve in your present appointment what is it that you improvements that you would like to improve and also Uh, I told them that it has to be related to the core activities. It can't be a fancy idea which is totally unrelated to the Air Force or it is uh, just with an objective of self-projection etc. No, the Air Force has uh, core activities like operations, engineering, administration, training, logistics, you know. So these are core activities no matter who does what, they'll be sustained and they'll be continued. But if you bring in some fancy uh, ideas of you know of projecting the air force you know making dramas making other things uh, one individual may like it the next one will not so in the end that ends up as an effort and time and money being wasted uh, so this is the approach uh, that i adopted and uh, of course when they brought in their plans uh, we created a grander plan by dovetailing all of them into one uh, cohesive plan and uh, well uh, ultimately actually in leadership they say that uh, who determines how the leader has been is determined by the subordinates you know ultimately they are the ultimate judge of deciding who has been a good leader it's not up to the leader to say that i was good it is the led who decide that you know this leader was uh, good or not so good so uh, i cannot make any claims but whatever legacy i uh, left behind if it is that is being uh, pursued uh, or that has contributed in some way to uh, was the improvement of the air force uh, i would be proud of but what i can say with confidence is that whatever corporate decisions that we took whatever equipment that we wanted to induct because the tenure of the chief is only 3 years you know the induction process from the time of conception till the time of uh, fruition you know is anywhere between 5 to 7 years or in, be even beyond like in the case of jf 70 it has been going on uh, now for almost 15 16 years so uh, but as long as uh, the decisions are made in a corporate manner that means it has the inputs of our uh, people you know uh, the chances are that even when you leave the scene those will be uh, done are there any particular influences um, or or uh um leaders that you've been inspired by or taken influence from as a pilot officer i subscribe to time magazine you know and so for 12 or 13 years i was a regular subscriber of time magazine i used to reach from one end to the other end so every pakistan you do that i mean <laughs> i don't know okay <laughs> starting from 1983 onwards uh, because now i had uh, grown you know intellectually and otherwise I started to subscribe to Economist mm. magazine, you know, 
and uh, to this day i uh, read economist you know because uh, it is such a complete magazine and then uh, there were uh, three books that influenced my life you know one was uh, stephen r covey's book uh, uh, no i read most of his books the first book that i read uh, first things first you know that was the first book of stephen covey that i read but of course i read his six seven uh, uh, later books also then uh, there was another gentleman uh, edward de bono you know uh, his uh, i've read again all his five seven books but the book that i liked most was textbook of wisdom uh, it's a fantastic book you know it's only 120 pages on one side there are eight and lines on the other side there are some scribbling that he has done and uh, the third one is uh, uh, lessons of history uh, by will and ariel duran you know husband and wife team they have uh, i'm sure you have so these three books i read and uh, it told me everything about not everything i mean no, nobody can know everything but most of the things that i believe in have come from uh, these books and uh, so much so that uh, <laughs> when president musharraf was in office as we all know that he didn't think things through you know he was a commando you know he uh, believed more in bravado less in thinking you know and this book was uh, a really nice book i mean its bottom line was that first of all there is no reality that is acceptable to everyone these are merely uh, perceptions you know number 2 that uh, that you know uh, the biggest hurdle to wisdom is arrogance and certainty and that president musharraf had to the utmost <laughs> so how can he be wise and a person a leader who is not wise you know uh, will bound to become a failure in the short run he may succeed but in the long run he will so i wanted to send this book to him you know <laughs> because i didn't tell him i couldn't tell him in as many words <laughs> so as luck would have it that there was another south Af uh, south american uh, economist who came and he uh, gifted us a book president musharraf sent me that book and there was a lecture also by that economist uh, somewhere in the army uh, camp uh, and at end. so taking uh, advantage of that i really gifted him this book textbook of wisdom you know and as luck would have it uh hcc called mr edward de bono to pakistan to lecture in our universities and uh, one of my friends a master kazi javed was uh, then the uh, rector of or uh, vc of uh, a university so he told dr de bono that our a chief uh, is very fond of you you know he has read all your books so edward de bono came to uh, my office to meet me so we had a cup of tea uh, and a cup shop I told him. I said, Doctor Dumono, uh, this book is uh, priceless. I mean, there's no. I can't describe any value on this. But the uh, the title is not good. Yeah. So he laughed. Huh? He says, I absolutely agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he said that you know when I write any book, uh, Prince Philip, uh, I send him an advance copy. He he's himself an Irish. You know, but he says when I write book, I uh, send it to Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip, this copy. He said when I wrote this book, uh, I was hesitant uh, because I thought that if I send it to him, he may think that I am not wise. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I said precisely that is reason that I was reluctant to send it to Sharaf <laughs> that he might think that I am not wise. But I said it was it is a book that should be read by uh, you know everyone. What I would like to ask, sir, is which uh, personal habits of yours would you credit um, for all of this uh, success that you've um, achieved? I know reading is one thing that you mentioned before, but but what else? Uh, reading was uh, one. Uh, the the other was that uh, I uh, you know 
was truthful i never dodged anyone ever never made an attempt you know to fool people uh, and uh, uh, would want to do my uh, job as diligently as uh, possible and uh, uh, also that uh, because, uh, that i i had a strong faith in fate and destiny you know uh, i believe that you know uh, that you uh, i I, I i was from a rather humble background you know uh, i still remember uh, when my father when we were uh, one day we went home for eat and uh, there was uh, i have four brothers and uh, two uh, one more brother and four sisters one day we went home for eat and there were six cars lined up in our house you know and we were sitting outside and he had tears in his eyes he said i could not imagine this day you know <laughs> he said i i in my wildest of dreams i could not imagine this day and this was uh, now everybody has cars but this was almost 20 years ago you know uh, and uh, and he was also very uh, matlab contented and you know that i learned from him and uh, so i i always had uh, faith that uh, you know uh, between the time of musa sahab's accident and my uh, appointment there was one month there. people used to visit me in my office because the office was not working mostly at that time and they would ask me sir what do you think now you know what will happen i said look uh, first thing is that life neither begins nor ends with becoming a chief you know uh, this it's not a you know and i said if i somebody senior becomes the chief i will continue to serve till i retire if uh, somebody uh, if i become the chief there isn't a problem if somebody junior to me becomes a chief i will go home the following morning huh? and there is life after that we don't know i mean uh, how is it that you are willing to rely on allah's beneficence Uh, while you're in service, and you want to give up after retirement, how important, sir, is it for an organization to have a vision, and for that vision to actually translate into um, some tangible benefits for the organization? Values, you know, uh, and the roles. Not only that, we gave it to the Air Force. We asked every branch to uh, derive a mission for themselves, you know, and uh, so so what we did was. that uh, also uh, what i felt was that uh, the first time that the cadets joined the academy uh, i uh, towards the later part of my tenure i used to go and address these cadets you know because uh, that is the place where he must understand what life is about why is he joined the air force you know so what we did was that uh, at the entrance of the academy we made a mural you know where the aeroplanes are set up set up over there but on that we read why am i here you know we asked him a question you know so uh, this cadet who is entering he asks himself why am i here what the hell am i doing here you know and uh, so he goes along uh, as he goes close to the cadet mess there is an answer provided to him huh? i am here uh, i am here to provide peace safety and security to my fellow citizens of pakistan mm-hmm. help enable provide peace uh, safety and security to people of pakistan you know so he is very clear you know that the job is larger than uh, his salary and his uh, this thing so we started this and uh, and uh, our vision for the air force was to be amongst the most respected air forces of the world you know it doesn't have to do anything with equipment etc i was going to say that came said on lacquer lacquer huh Black-a-tay. but the fact of the matter is that everybody respects us when you became the chief hmm. then your responsibility would have uh, expanded to include hmm. those other you know out of the 12 those hmm. other 10 people hmm. and their likes hmm. who were you know uh, doing a 10 to 12 job rather than a hmm. seri to a study hmm. job hmm. as the air chief um, you had that uh, you know probably that responsibility one could say mm-hmm. to uh, provide motivation to them and inspiration to them mm-hmm. and also 
uh, given that at the end of the day, the Air Force is um, is a government organization. Mm -hmm. The tools that you would have had might also have been a little limited. Mm -hmm. How did you manage this? You see, uh, it was very. It is pretty simple, you know. Uh, what does uh, a human uh, live on? You know, a human lives on hope of a better future, of better days ahead. You know, in an organization like the armed forces, you give this hope by implementation of merit. You know, as long as people understand that this guy has no favorites, he is not partial, neither is he biased, you know, he will only decide on merit, then they will put in their best. You know, if they think, uh, you know, I, I used to tell people that uh, when I went abroad, it was such a pleasure, you know, uh, to go from, uh, I mean, we, uh, many times we underestimate Pakistan, but whenever I went abroad, it was such a pleasure, whether I went to France, whether I went to Belgium, you know, these countries were technically so advanced, you know, and uh, yet, you know, they couldn't achieve the type of things that these guys had given up on maintaining the mirages 25 years ago. We are still flying the mirages, you know, without having the industrial capability to support them fully. You know, those people manufacture these aeroplanes. On the other hand, you look at these rich countries like Saudi Arabia and UAE, you know, they have the best of equipment, you know, but they don't have the best of people. Why do they not have best of people? Because these guys, the commander, the base commander, the squad commander has to have some link with this royal family. You know, there's no merit. So this guy who has a link with the royal family, you know, doesn't need to work hard. The other guy who's not from the royal family doesn't want to work hard because there is nothing for him. You know, so here, this the 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 uh, issue of merit is so important that. Uh, in fact, two things. Uh, in the corporate world, money has a way of organizing things, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the military, if you ensure merit uh, and you honor merit, the rest is all simple. You would find that merit is, is not something that can sustain ja sakta hai. Itna pressure se hota hai. Mm -hmm. How has it exerted uh, pressure on the Air Force? How has it managed to survive? And, and retain this focus on merit in the midst of all of these pressures that, that and you know the fact that we derive our people from the same nation mm -hmm. how have you managed that well <laughs> it was difficult you know uh, in the sense that uh, because uh, it is so prevalent the element of sefarish is so prevalent uh, because as soon as we became the chief you know, from all kinds, all my relatives, uh, uh, these people would get hold of my brother, of my uncle, and you know, would come <laughs> and say that, you know, this job has to be done. I told them, look, it cannot be done. Whatever is not according to the rules uh, uh, will not be done. He says, what do I tell these guys? There's a lot of pressure on this. I said, you tell them that uh, my brother is an idiot. You know, <laughs> he doesn't listen to me. Huh? Uh, what can I do? You know, uh, so this is what uh, we did, and uh, soon they realized that you know it cannot be done. But having said that, there were occasions when I proved it to them that this guy who uh, is bringing you along with him uh, is actually uh, uh, not telling you the truth. You know, he is telling you partial truth. You know, and I proved it to him in one or two cases that you know uh, the punishment that was given to him by the court martial was uh, merited mm -hmm. you know so uh, i i uh, tell my subordinates to follow the rules not to break the rules you know so how can i uh, you know pardon him uh, it sets a bad example similarly uh, the the uh, in, i went to one of the bases and one uh, chief tech or somebody got up he says sir I want to highlight a problem in the Air Force policy. I said, yes, go ahead. He said, sir, we send our officers from the engineering branch uh, abroad for studies, for PhD and masters, and they, uh, uh, you know, don't come back, you know, 
some don't come back at all some come back after eight to ten years and the Air Force takes them back uh, uh, you know after uh, punishing them nominally but when an airman deserts you know and he's caught you know he's court martialed and he's you know uh, released from the service I said well done you know uh, I didn't notice this dichotomy rest assured that when I go back this anomaly would be removed you know so I came back and I got hold of my uh, staff officers personal uh, principal staff officers and I said look there is a dark out and I told personnel branch that this has to be removed as luck would have it three months down the line uh, an officer came back uh, who was a deserter and he was caught and uh, my uh, cook is not here I can't offer you a cup of tea right now we just come here thank you so much so uh, and you know he was caught and uh, you know he was put into the cell and uh, as luck would have it his father was an air commodore a star jurat of 1965 war you know <laughs> now he uh, sent messages through different people that please ask the chief to pardon him uh, I said nothing doing uh, it concerns the morale of the service you know and uh, I can't uh, for his follies huh? why should I uh, do this he wrote me a uh, DO letter yeah? he said that you know I'm the, such a charge and I was a awardee I was a star jurat and this that and the other um, I replied to him politely sir I said sir uh, we are uh, grateful to you for the fine service that we inherited from you what we are trying to do is to build upon the same Beautifully put. Yes. you know uh, you believed in your time in a system of uh, award and punishment, reward and punishment. We are just pursuing that, you know. And uh, I'm sorry uh, that your son uh, happens to be uh, the first victim of this policy, but I owe it to my organization to be fair to everyone, you know, regardless of uh, rank or you know their category of employment, you know. Uh, he was not happy obviously you know he was not happy but he, this officer was court martialed uh, he was imprisoned for six months you know and then he was discharged from service without any benefits it would be very helpful sir to um, understand a little more how you take decisions or um, how you view risk on decision making uh, when I was very young uh, when Reagan was the president I still recall one of his statement you know Reagan was a relaxed leader uh, and uh, people used to ask him I said he said you are the president of the United States you have the burden of the whole world on you and how is it that you are so relaxed he says well uh, I'm relaxed because if I take my decision at 6 p.m. I take this decision based on the information that I have at 6 p.m. at so based on that input I take my decision based on my judgment I don't worry about posterity, what posterity will think about me, you know, and that is a point that I have remembered. Mm. I also believe that, you know, uh, that if it is a corporate decision, you know, uh, uh, we would discuss, debate, all kinds of, uh, you know, inputs will be available. Uh, and I never believed that I had a monopoly on wisdom, you know, I just had a little more experience than the other crowd that was sitting with me. But otherwise, in that room, at any given time, there were six centuries of experience uh, sitting there, you know. And so, uh, if it was a corporate decision making, the chances are that we won't go wrong. Uh, and posterity has shown that we didn't uh, go wrong. Uh, the other was that, uh, uh, of course, uh, we uh, didn't procrastinate, you know. We wanted things uh, done uh, quickly. Uh, as soon as possible and uh, and we did those we uh, again because of belief in, I, and I'll give you a practical example of this I was director plans uh, at that time the GPS was a novelty the Chinese aeroplane had very poor uh, compasses you know uh, you flew you didn't know whether you were going uh, 240 or you were going 230 or 220 heading uh, their, their direction uh, indicator was so poor 
uh, and of course the navigation was difficult so get, getting to the target was a problem so i uh, uh, so we came to know that army for their tags was evaluating the uh, gpss so we asked them please send us a report and uh, ask these garmin was the company ask garmin to uh, send us a gps so they sent us a gps we carried out trials on each different type of aeroplane and uh, the trials began i think in september october and in december we uh, decided to uh, induct uh, gps on our airplanes and by march modification was done you know all around so the army people they got hold of uh, this information they came to me he says sir uh, their questionnaire was this thick you know their report was this thick written by a lieutenant colonel and this uh, and one major and one subedar and somebody and uh, they had not yet decided about inducting this they were still going around so finally this colonel was intrigued he says sir uh, can i come to your office i said come to my office he said sir can i see the report based on uh, the, uh, which you have taken this decision to you know install this on our airplanes i said yes i told my pa uh, bring that file so he brought a file and there was a, a one page report by one of the uh, flying squadron commander fighter squadron commanders you know and he looked at it <laughs> that's all he said he said that's all i said yes that's all when he we trust him when he says it is good we believe it is good and that's it there's no discussion <laughs> he couldn't believe it <laughs> he said i said look the way you are going about it you will never be able to Uh, uh get it because uh, as the army is it wants all kinds of insur- assurances it was wanting an assurance from the department of defense that in case of war with india they will not shut down these satellites you know <laughs> i said how in hell will the department of defense ever give you uh, meet this uh, requirement of yours <laughs> so uh, ask about a slightly uh, emotional issue next sir and this is um, the tragedy involving uh, air chief marshal musaf sahab just before you took over when you took over it must have been a difficult time for the organization both in terms of the loss that uh, um, the, the uh, organization had suffered um, given the accident involving the former chief and also the lack of uh, continuity that uh, might have uh, been one of the after effects of of that accident how did you tackle these issues uh, it was uh, a trauma for the entire air force you know uh, obviously it was difficult to come to terms with it so what i did was that normally you know when you become the chief you have an open house where everybody comes to congratulate you and all you know i didn't i forfeited that i didn't have hold that you know because you know the sentiments of the people were raw and there wasn't a celebration Sounds required like a strong message huh there wasn't a celebration required huh so uh, and so i uh, but after a month and a half i uh, made my uh, inaugural visits to uh, the bases and i told people that look uh, we are all sad at what has happened but we have to get on with life Um, if you could go back in time and advise a younger um, Kaleem Sadat um, on on how to set course for the future, some things to change, uh, what would that advice be? I, I, I was fortunate that at a young age also, I thought that uh, giving was more important. You know, like for example, I was in a plans directorate and. Uh, are you could give ed to people in civilian clothes you know this uh, so other civil uh, this thing but it was not customary to give ed to uniform uh, ors you know and uh, so i told my officers that uh, on eid let's send 2 uh, kilos of mithai to every uniform person mm. you know and these guys you know some of the officers objected i said sir we uh, we shouldn't put them into bad habits of you know expecting things on i said these are not bad habits you don't want to pay I don't want to contribute don't do it i am not forcing you huh? but it is uh, just a uh, way to show them that we care that we notice them that we are bothered about their small uh, happiness you know that on this occasion they will go home and they said somebody remembered us somebody remembered their children you know 
so uh, you know uh, ultimately you, you realize that uh, it is better to give than to get you know and if, if you are in a position to give uh, you should thank Allah you know uh, that he has made you in a position to uh, give. Could you talk a little bit sir about uh, uh, JF17 uh, program that um, was fast-tracked um, under your leadership what lessons uh, did you learn there and uh, implement uh, to get it going? Actually, what I had, uh, what you learned in life, you know, before you get to this stage, is that uh, you perceive uh, why things slow down, you know, how hurdles are created, and uh, so uh, with that experience, you uh, uh, know uh, uh, what things are not to be done, what things are to be done. Uh, my experience was that uh, the chief project director, you know, uh, whenever he was changed, he uh, created problems because he came with a new thinking. He uh, may not necessarily agree with the uh, basis uh, of that project, but in the you know, in the continuity. And then as the technology changed, he may say, oh, no, 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 we need to uh, get this and, you know, this is the uh, state of the art. Unfortunately, you cannot uh, uh, keep current with the state of the art with an ongoing project. Mm -hmm. You know, it will always be changing. It will always be changing. So you you can make projections for the future. You know, but the project must proceed along. You know. So what I did, I said, this project director that I have inherited is not going to change in my time. You know. And uh, Air Marshal Shahid Latif was the uh, project director. He came to me several times and said, I want to be the DCSO, I want. I said, look, uh, you may want to be the DCSO. Uh, what is it that you want to do as a DCSO? Uh, you, uh, I said, if you gift this aeroplane to this nation, wouldn't that be a big enough achievement? Than being DCSO, uh, you know, very high five appointment, you know. Uh, and so he uh, sent people also to me, you know, influential people here and there. I said, I'm not doing this because it will slow down the program. We are at a very crucial stage, you know. It requires continuity of thought huh? uh, and continuity of conception. Huh? Only then it will proceed. The moment I bring in it, it, it will slow down the project by at least a year. And I don't want to do that, you know. So I didn't uh, do that. Uh, at the end, sir, I would... Uh, uh very much like to learn how your definition of success has evolved um, over the course of your career and how do you define success today? Well, success obviously uh, varies with time, you know. Uh, in the situation that I am now, uh, the success for me now is that I can spend my time in the way I want and I can meet the people whom I want to meet at whatever time I want to be. Huh? This is the ultimate success. People say, uh, sir, why don't you work? I said, I have worked non-stop for 43 years. You know, God has given me the opportunity to rest, relax, <laughs> enjoy. Huh? Why should I work? The Air Force, mashallah, and the government has given me enough to live a dignified life. You know, why, why would I want to work? No, sir, you are experienced, you know, you have so much of knowledge, you have uh, so much of insight, etc. I said, if uh, I had that and if somebody needed it, they wouldn't have retired me. <laughs> the fact that they've retired me shows that they don't need it, you know. So why should I bother? He said, but after such a hectic life, uh, how is it that you find yourself nothing to do? I said, uh, life is a process from the time of your birth till your death. You know, uh, you will be happy if you reconcile with every phase of your life. I don't dwell on the past. I don't live in the past. I don't regret what I have, what I had. You know, I'm happy with what I have, you know, and that is the source of my happiness. That is also I consider my success, you know, otherwise success was that you continue to uh, grow in your organization. And if you reach the top, well, uh, that is uh, success. And uh, now, of course, uh, what has changed is that uh, at that stage, not towards the later part, but for quite some time, for about 25 years, 
uh, the emphasis on get was on getting this, getting that. You know, now it has changed.